So, uh, we are now ready to start the symposium. Welcome, and um, yeah, everybody here in the room and also everybody online, specifically the colleagues from um, South and North and um, America, for whom it is currently in the middle of the night. So, among them is my co-moderator, Sharon Grant, from the Field Museum in Chicago. And also I saw at least one of the presenters. So, um, just some housekeeping. By now you know how the, how the sessions work. Um, for the speakers, please keep on time. Um, for everybody else, if you have questions, please come to the front and take the microphone. Um, we will keep it a bit flexible if we have uh, questions after the talks directly or if we collect them um, in the end where we have a, a slot for discussion. Um, online, please, everybody, um, write your questions in the chat and we will transfer it then also on Slack and we will uh, check the chat um, that your questions are incorporated. Um, so, I think we will just start in with the first um, presentation which I will present for our um, partnership. Um, So, we are 10 partners from uh, South America, um, Europe and North America. And to start out the session, we would like to give you some history into the Global Collections Campaign and our current uh, GBFC SP pro uh, project, um, which is focused on Latin America and the Caribbean. And from the history arise the goals that we have. So in 2019, um, EPBS Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services came out. It summarized how bad the situation currently is and how far we are into um, a biodiversity crisis. It was a wake-up call to the world and Spinach um, responded. So the Society for the Preservation of Natural History collect, uh, Collections, and it's affectionately known as Spinach, um, is an international society with over 550 members from 30 countries on five continents. Its mission is to improve the preservation, conservation, and management of natural history collections and of the biological objects stored in them to ensure the continuing value to scientific research, education, and society. Um, in response to the Global Assessment Report, Spinach then, um, President Barbara Tears initiated the formation of Spinach Biodiversity Crisis Response Committee. The work of the committee focuses on the intersection of scientific collections and biodiversity conservation. Its goals can be taken as goals for natural science collections and the institutions everywhere. The committee's charter charges us to consider how spinach as a professional society and through actions of members can respond to the biodiversity crisis. The mission is to advocate, support, and develop collections, contribution to conservation by enabling scientific research, fostering the implementation of innovative action, and shaping po of policy, as well as communication, education, and policy outreach. What the IPBS report drove home was that the biodiversity crisis is a global phenom phenomenon 
that required solution also at the global level by a global community. However, looking at us, us in the committee, all of us were initially from the global north. After a first outreach into the community in the form of a panel discussion, two colleagues from Latin America joined. Soledad Tankov, a conservator uh, working at the Museo Argentino de Ciencias Naturales Bernardino Rivadavia in Buenos Aires, and Alina Freire-Firo, a professor at ICIEM, the Universidad Regional Amazonica in Ecuador. Sol, Alina, and Martin Wiemers, a colleague from Germany, and I formed the Regional Diversity Working Group within the committee in 2021. Around the world, people are caring for natural science collections as collection staff, scientists, or as individuals with private collections. They do so for getting to know and in investigating biodiversity. So today, general also for providing facts and insights into the protection of biodiversity. Thus, in a way, we don't need to improve the diversity of the community. Um, it's all out there. However, we aren't connected, thus we don't know about each other and therefore can't combine our efforts and support each other. So looking around in spinach, Tadwick, in the discussions of, uh, and promotions uh, for the digital extended specimen um, infrastructure, the majority of us are still from the global north, academic, white, and also a bit older. As regional diversity working group, we want to change that and involve a wider diversity of stakeholders. Collection staff, scientists, governmental agents and officers, private collectors, conservation managers and activists. Associ associated with uh, natural science collections in, colle in so want to involve them in collections networking and biodiversity conservation at the global level. Thereby the goal was and is to foster a community structure that reflects the diversity of the global community within the international organizations and efforts, be the SPINET, TADWIC, the International Partners Group, or GBIF. At the same time, we have um, to have more individuals from the whole range of different and divergent backgrounds be active at a cross-continental level will open opportunities and new perspectives for the community as a whole. Thus, last year, we were looking for information resources about collections around the world. We found the GBIF report on advancing the catalog of the world's natural science collections and connected with Marie Grosjean and Andrea Hahn from the team maintaining and developing the Global Registry of Scientific Collections, GeoCycle, at GBIF. GeoCycle brings together and aggregates records for collections and the institutions worldwide from previous, as well as current and some independently maintained resources. As for example, the IDEC Bio US Collections List and Index Herbariorum for botanical collections. Thus, GeoCycle harmonizes existing resources and provides a single entry point and just very practical and address book for collections worldwide. Quite exciting, and, and as far as I know, um, the only module at uh, GBIF, um, GeoCycle has the functionality that enables community curation through interaction, interactive user interfaces. So collection contact points can maintain the records themselves. The community can submit suggestions and editors can act as intermediators to validate and accept changes. Last summer, we, that is the GeoCycle team at GBEF, the Regional Diversity Working Group uh, of the Biodiversity Crisis Committee um, at Spinach, and the National GBEF Node for Ecuador, together started a pilot campaign 
for expanding the presence of Ecuadorian collections in GeoCycle. The experiences from this campaign formed the starting point for the application for a capacity enhancement support program project at the start of this year, our current CESP project. So the GBEF national nodes and their network, which is spanning the whole of the globe, are centers of capacity for biodiversity data within countries and across the region. They provide a backbone of expertise and knowledge about national and regional institutions and scientific collections, as well as their data. In our project, the national nodes for Argentina, Ecuador and Guatemala are partners um, in our endeavor. Furthermore, the former and the current regional node representatives for the Latin American and Caribbean region are also members of our group. The aims of our project are to, impro to improve the diversity and representation within the collections community at large, as well as within GBEF and Spinach. Um, we aim to increase the number, coverage, and diversity of high-quality records available through GeoCycle. And we, um, we will develop uh, a campaign blueprint package in Spanish, uh, Spanish and English. Perfect. Um, so with that, I would like to um, hand over to the next four um, talks. Um, two of them report uh, from two existing very successful regional networks. And um, the other two talks are more infrastructure um, focused and provide um, insights into perspective and buildings blocks for a global collections network. Um, if there are, are there currently questions here in the room or online? Can, do we have a connection to online that I can ask uh, my fellow moderator? I was, so I will check with that if there are questions online and I think we should just move on to the next talk. Um, we, you have it, okay. Um, which is from Mar Maria Regina uh, Barbosa. Um, she um, is from Brazil and will present uh, the Brazilian network. Um, she has a recording. Mm -hmm. Good morning. So, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear Clearly. you. Okay, so again, good morning to everyone. I'm Maria Regina Barbosa from the Federal University of Paraíba in Brazil. It's a pleasure to be here virtually to talk about the experience of the INCT Virtual Herbarium, a network of Brazilian and foreigners herbaria with collections from Brazil. Well, Brazil is a mega diversity country and holds 15 to 20% of all known plant species. We have records in our 
country of more than 47,000 native species of plants and fungi. But despite all that diversity, uh, no Brazilian herbarium is in the top 10 of the largest herbaria in the world. The largest and one of the oldest herbarium in Brazil is that of the Rio de Janeiro Botanical Garden with 850,000 specimens, number 82 in the world range. However, um, if we look at all the specimens available in the country, Brazil is number 14 with 8.5 million specimens. So we are more representative together. And that was the background for the development of the INCT virtual barrier. But what are the INCTs? INCTs, the National Institutes of Science and Technology, integrate a program that brings together research groups in areas of strategic importance for the sustainable development of Brazil. INCTs are responsible for the qualification and training of personnel in their areas of expertise and must develop programs to teach and disseminate science to the general public. The INCT Virtual Herbarium of Flora and Funga falls into the category of ecology and environment science. The leading institution is the Federal University of Pernambuco with partners in all states of the Federation. Oh. The virtual herbarium started in 2009 with 25 Brazilian herbaria and two from the US, the New York Botanical Garden and the Missouri Botanical Garden. Today, the virtual herbarium connects 192 collections, 25 from major European and US herbaria. Together, uh, we share more than 11 million records of plants and fungi collected in Brazil and almost 5 million images. Every day, more than 1.5 million specimen records are assessed. Oh. Uh, our main goals uh, are organize and make available online the data contained in the labels of the herbarium specimens collected in the country and train human resources to study the diversity of plants and fungi and to create botanical collections. The INCT virtual herbarium is not only a data aggregator, but an active and integrated community with common objectives, free sharing of good quality data, personal training, and the development of the applications and tools for identifying knowledge gaps and to help plan new collecting expeditions. The INCT virtual herbarium had the benefit of expertise from already existing initiatives, which when brought together made its development possible within a short period. Particularly, the Species Link Network, developed and maintained by the Heffers Center for Environmental Information, CRIA, which is our platform. In 2021, more than 52 billion records from INCT were used and more than 6.3 million images. And we are not counting those records or images consulted from GBIF or CBBR platforms, uh, uh, Brazilian platform, or from the Flora and Fungo of Brazil project, which are served with, with our data. 
the virtual herbarium provides creators and users with some important tools. The data cleaning that analyzes the quality and integrity of the records, indicating the correctness or not of scientific names, spelling errors, suspect coordinates, and disagreement in the identification of duplicates of the same collection in different herbaria. It helps creators to identify possible errors, but records are not modified. The system only presents suspect records in red, recommending that they should be checked. Another tool, the annotation system, allows the insertion by users of annotations and comments associated with each record. And those will be automatically sent, it, sent to the appropriate herbarium curator. These annotations are attached to the online version of the specimen label data and provide a direct communication link between the user and the creator of the collection being viewed. It's a dynamic mechanism for updating and correction of errors. The SKT is a web service for visualizing and analyzing images associated with the herbarium records. The service allows the observation of details by zooming, rotation, measurement, and downloads. It's an extremely useful tool for taxonomic and floristic studies, for checking determinations and specimen label data. Gaps or lacunas in Portuguese was developed to facilitate the identification of taxonomic and geographic information gaps of native species. The system displays the status of online da data for all valid native species included in the Brazilian Flora and Funga Project including those without any record in the INCT virtual herbarium. The system compares the Brazilian states where the specialists indicated that the species occurs with the states that actually have occurrence points in the INCT virtual herbarium, highlighting the gaps. Finally, the BioGeo, a system which analyzes the potential geographic distribution of species based on their ecological niches using occurrence data from the INCT virtual herbarium. Users can select the data and carry out a correlation with environmental variables to produce models of the ecological niches of the species and predicts where these species could potentially occur. The models can be pub published online and can be used to search for new populations of the species concerned. Concluding, the INCT virtual herbarium brings together partners of very different size, institutional characteristics and geographic location, valuing all kinds of collections through their participation as a member, members of a large network. The social network works together to improve the quality and usability, usability of the data and to develop the tools which facilitates, facilitate different kinds of analysis and uses. The success achieved by the INCT Virtual Herbarium Network certainly contributes to improve the knowledge of Brazil's biodiversity and can be a model for similar initiatives. I would like to thank all participants of the INCT Virtual Herbarium, our sponsors and supporters, and you all for your attention.
Can you hear me? Hi, Yuta. I don't know if you can hear hear us over here. There is a question from Maria. Okay, will you take okay. the question? Um, from from Ian Engelbrecht um, is asking if there is a link for the Exocati that you showed just now. Yeah. Uh you just have to click on the image that is online so you can assess it and download, measure, rotate it. It's associated with the online label of the specimen. Thank Thanks, you very much. Hopefully, Ian, that, that gets your question. Um, you to also, there are a couple of questions from Carlos um, for the panel discussion at the end. So I will um, hold on to those, Carlos. And when we get to the end, I will will open up for you to, to ask those if that's okay. That sounds perfect. Thanks a lot, Sharon. Um, here in the room, are there questions here? Then we move on to Marie Grosjean from GBEF. Does this work? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Um. Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, hi, hello everyone. My name is Marie Grosjean and I work at uh, the GBIF Secretariat as a data administrator. And um, so today I am gonna present you a GR cycle, which is uh, short for the Global Registry of Scientific Collections, which is something we host now at GBIF. So um, my colleague uh, actually uh, went to Midjourney, which is an AI system, and uh, typed in uh, Global Registry of Scientific Collections, and this is the image that came up. It's very pretty, but it's not exactly what we have. Um, GR Cycle is actually a website, and it's a website that contains information about scientific collections, specifically physical scientific collections, not just natural history. It can be from um, also, you know, uh, ethnography, for example, but, um, but we're focusing on physical collections. It's community curated, so I'll get back to that in a little bit. It contains um, about 8,000 uh, 8, institutions and 6,000 collections. It, it's also a reference for um, institution and collection codes and identifiers, and the information sp is spread across 198 countries, as you can read on my slide. Um, if you want to access the information, uh, the URL is here, but I'm sure that someone will post it in the chat as well. Um, one thing that um, we did when we um, inherited the GR cycle is that we decided that it would be great to be able to link GBIF occurrences to GR cycle when possible. So that's, that's what we did. And we are linking mostly, well, only specimen occurrences. Um, about, about 100 million specimen occurrences are linked to GR cycle entries. And the way it works is that it's linked at the occurrence level. So, for example, if you have an institution that shares a big data set with multiple collections uh, together, then you can have them linked to individual collection entries in GR cycle. So, uh, it can be a way to aggregate metrics at another level than what you would have on GBIF, for example. Um, so who and what is GR cycle for? I'll just go a little bit uh, quick on that one. Uh, but it's a way for institutions to be more discoverable and have their work more visible. It's another place where they can be. It's also for the community to find the collections that are relevant for them and to find who they can contact to, to get in touch, ask questions and network. Uh, it's also for national organizations like GBIF nodes uh, to maybe get an overview of what there is in their country, but also uh, maybe find new targets for data mobilization, and I'll get back to that uh, in the next slide. And um, it's also, uh, I mentioned, a registry for codes and identifiers, so it can help with the database inter interoperability, and we have an API 
that can be used to uh, resolve codes and identifiers to institutions and collections. So that can be a useful tool for many of us. Um, so we have tried at the, at the GBIF Secretariat with our team of uh, Asian and African uh, support um, contractors to uh, see how we could use GRCycle to mobilize data, meaning to get new data sets in GBIF. And so they've been doing a great work at, uh, at checking information available on GRCycle for institutions in those regions and to identify how much of it is already in GBIF and what is out there uh, that could be interesting to, uh, to share with the world. And so this is ongoing. They're working on um, the workflow at the time. They're using GitHub. Uh, I can answer questions if you're interested, but know that this is an example where this is useful because not everything is in um, um, digitized format as occurrences, obviously, as you all know. Um, I mentioned that the information is community curated, so anyone can go to GRCycle and click on the suggested change button and uh, access the editing interface and suggest updates uh, on the core information. They can add missing entries like collections and institution. They can merge duplicates if they find any or if an institution should actually be a collection, they can also suggest that as well. And all the suggestions will be forwarded to me or the GeoCycle team, which is mostly me. And then I will actually forward that to relevant people for review. And then the information can be um, updated. Um, we, we click apply or discard. Or we can get in touch with people if we have questions. Um, so that's one way to update information on GeoCycle. Another way is to become editor or mediator. So. Uh, editors and mediators can both update information directly in GRCycle uh, without going through the suggestion system. Uh, but mediators can also merge, delete, and transform entries. And both of them can actually review suggestions that arrive. So I will uh, forward that to, um, to our editors and mediators. And the scope for their permission can be at the, institution, at the collection level, at the institution level, or at the national level. And in practice, what we have is a, an editor is often someone from an institution who will maintain the collection records for their institution, and mediator will be more a GBIF node or someone who has a national overview, and they will be often uh, able to sort of uh, in a, be in a position to check suggestions and see if, if they make sense. We also have, uh, as Yuta mentioned, a number of information that comes from, uh, from external sources. So in this particular example, we have the Natural History Museum in Paris, where the information for the institution comes from the, the, the GBIF publishing organization page. Uh, and information for this particular Mollus collection comes from a data set that was published on GBIF. So every time the data set is updated in the IPT, every time the metadata, the description of the data set is updated in the IPT, then the collection information will be updated in GR cycle. And um, we have the herbarium collection information that's updated uh, on, that it comes from Index Herbarium, which is a, 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 a national database, an international database hosted at the uh, New York Botanical Garden about herbaria. And so the idea is that we want people to not have to maintain multiple sources of information everywhere. You can just pick one and then hopefully we'll be able to grab that and to uh, show information up to date in GRCycle. But in practice, what we have is that a little bit more than half of the records in GRCycle are maintained in Index Abirum. Very few records are actually maintained in GBIF datasets and publishing organizations. I also mentioned an API that we have, um, and this API can also be used to uh, update information on GRCycle. And uh, right now we have had at least two examples of people who have um, maybe a national registry and they exported that to a table and that table can be used to, with the API to update information directly in GRCycle. Um, and uh, our team of mediator at the moment is about um, not yet 40 mediators and we cover 52 countries. Uh, and here you can see a map of the countries for which we have a mediator. Uh, so someone who can review suggestions. 
And in blue, the countries that are in blue are actually uh, countries that are handled by our team of um, uh, contractors. So, I'm still good, I hope. So who are the key partnerships? So um, at GBIF, we, uh, we host GR Cycle, we oversee the roadmap, um, we, we uh, make sure that uh, new features can be developed. We also work very well with the uh, Index Abirum with the New York Botanical Garden because a lot of information comes from them and we also give them feedback when we get it. Uh, IDIC Bio imported about 15,000, not 15,000, 1,500 uh, collections into GR Cycle, and they're now using the GR Cycle API to show those collections on their collection website. Uh, I'm sure Kat might mention that in her presentation. We're also working with the NCBA, uh, NCBI Bio Collection in order to cross link GR Cycle entries and their registry and their uh, database. So the idea is that someone who uh, goes to GR Cycle will be able to know, oh, for that institution, that's the equivalent in the NCBI bio collection and vice versa. Um, so people can, uh, can navigate those um, databases. And finally, the main partner is the community because it's, it is community created and it is up to you to, to go and to also make sure the information is up to date. And that's what most of the, the work is around GR Cycle. Um, we are planning a few things for 2023. Uh, the main one is to make sure that GR Cycle is compatible with the Latimer core standard that was presented two days ago. Um, and so um, we, we haven't figured out how to do this, but we're going to be in touch with uh, <laughs> um, Sharon and everyone who is uh, Matt. I don't know if he's here, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm done. Um, we'll, we'll also make a new public website for GR Cycle and uh, make sure that the occurrences that are linked to GR Cycle entries can be browsed in that website as well. So uh, to make what we have currently a little bit prettier. So that's our plans for 2023. Um, thank you very much. And thank you for, to the team of uh, African and Asian contractors that are working on GR Cycle as well. And uh, if you're interested uh, and if you have want to collaborate, then you can write to scientific-collections at gbif.org. Okay, I'm not too late. Oh, okay, <laughs> it's good. Yeah, so... Uh, Okay. Okay. So thanks a lot, uh, yeah. Marie. Um, other questions? We have one in the in the chat. If um, Perfect. we have time. Yeah. Sure. From Siobhan. Um The question is for Marie: Is the GR Cycle dataset openly licensed? Um. I don't think we have licenses for GeoCycle records, but I assume it's yes. I'm looking at Joe. Um, he's nodding. No, yeah. Anything on GBIF is openly licensed, although we don't have a license specifically for GeoCycle records, but um, you can use the information if that's what you're asking. Yes, it's for everyone. Is that, is that, is it, does it answer? Is it, is it, is it a satisfying answer? Okay. Siobhan, I'll let you um, say yeah. whether it's a good answer or not. Yeah. Okay, cool. I can see the chat. So thanks. Okay. There's a, a second question there from Esteban. Um, the metrics of GeoCycle at the moment displays not only preserved specimen, but also human observation. Will there be a change to display just the preserved specimen? Um, so that's a good question. Um, so at the moment, the system for linking uh, GR cycle specimens, uh, GR cycle, sorry, GR cycle entries to occurrence records is the following. If an occurrence contains a collection or institution code or identifier, during ingestion, we attempt to linking it to what we have to GR, in GR cycle. And if we find a match, we will link it. 
at least at the institution level for every uh, record. So, um, so observations will be aggregated at the institution level if we are provided with a code identifier for institution or collection. Uh, and the reason for that sort of logic at that point was that, well, maybe institutions want to showcase their work, even though they, it, it's not a collection at that point, it's just observation, but it's still work um, featured by the institution, uh, well, done by the institution. But at the collection level, we only do um, specimens, and that's not just preserved specimen, it's also fossil specimens, living specimens, and material sample. Um, so it's a little bit of a ad hoc rule, but uh, that was the logic. So observations, if we are provided with the link, pretty much can be aggregated at the institution level. For collections, it's only preserved specimens. Oh, not preserved specimens, just specimens. Hopefully that, that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, we have to move on to the next talk. Um, which will be given by Kat Chapman uh, from IDIC Bio, and it will be a recorded presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Kat Chapman. I'm with IDIC Bio, and uh, I'm here to talk about our US collections list and how, as the title states, it's now powered by GBIF and with the sunglasses emoji because this is very cool, and hopefully, you all will agree by the end of this talk. So, uh, as so an introduction, first I'm going to start off with the, you know, a very simplified history, you know, what is the U.S. Collections List? And uh, followed by why we decided to make the switch of, uh, uh, from using our original uh, external infrastructure for this Collections List, why we decided to make the switch to using GBIF's infrastructure. Um, I'm going to talk about how we did it, and then finally I'll talk about where everything stands now, and what it all means for now and for the future. So a brief history. Um, early on in the IDIC Bio project, we were tasked with creating um, a ledger of sorts, um, indexing all of the natural history collections within the United States. So this was done algorithmically with a piece of web crawling software. Uh, so it attempted to automatically crawl the web, kind of like you know a Google web crawler. Um, and it attempted to parse out, you know, algorithmically, automatically, you know, contact information and metadata about natural history collections within the United States. So, you know, the data that this piece of software compiled for us was really useful for the IDIG Bio project early on in the project's history. So it served not only as uh, an index of natural history collections in the United States, but uh, it was also useful for our internal purposes at IDIG Bio for you know, data mobilization, outreach efforts, you know, we could go through the list, see the list of collections, contact information, it would allow us to easily reach out to people and try to onboard them, you know, to uh, the IDIG Bio project to get their data mobilized and on the web. Um, so finally, this, uh, this list is still alive, it's uh, still active, and at this URL here, you can access it and view it, play with it, have fun with it, still very much alive. And uh, as a little side note, so sometimes I get confusion about this, so I just want to emphasize here that this list of collections and all associated metadata with collections, you know, like collection name, where the collection lives, the scope, contact information, personnel information, so all of these metadata are, you know, technologically speaking and functionally speaking separate from specimen record data. You know, so this list of collections is kept separately from any sort of specimen record sets that we serve on iTech Bio. So I just wanted to make that clear. So here's a screenshot of what the collections list looks like today. Um, I took the screenshot like, just this week, and uh, you know, this is what you'll see if you go to the URL on the previous slide. Um, and just beneath this list, I, I wasn't able to <clears throat> fit everything into one screenshot on one slide, but there's actually a, a nifty little map that shows uh, approximate locations of all of these collections and institutions uh, plotted on a map, so you can see kind of where it is. It's kind of cool. Um, right, so here is a you know, brief and again simplified 
um, overview of the original workflow for how data got into the list and how changes were made. So first, you know, all of the sort of raw data, you know, be it collected again algorithmically or, you know, revised with input from the community. Um, all of this was submitted or collected um, and stored on GitHub. It was stored in JSON format, which stands for JavaScript Object no Notation. Um, and this was all compiled into a sort of endpoint, a JSON endpoint that was stored on GitHub. Uh, so if any, any changes or revisions were to be requested by, say, you know, a data provider. Let's say there was a personnel change and they wanted to let us know who the new contact for the curator at their museum was. Uh, we set up um, an automated form that people would submit information to. It would create an issue on the GitHub repository for the collections catalog. And then we would have to go in, manually review it, and manually you know, mess with raw JSON, make sure everything is validated, um, and then a third-party tool called Travis CI would further validate and consolidate everything and update the uh, JSON endpoint. So all of this is to say that the original workflow was really, really time-consuming, and virtually every step of the way required some sort of human involvement. And again, it relied on third-party services, GitHub and Travis CI. So why did we make the switch? Uh, like I said in the previous slide, you know, the original workflow relied very heavily, almost entirely, on third-party utilities. So that means if GitHub or Travis CI broke in any way, everything kind of fell apart. Um, the best case scenario would be that the list would be in a frozen state, so no changes could be made. Um, like if Travis CI broke, which it often did, especially towards the end, uh, you know, there could be no changes no changes finalized or submitted or integrated. So this workflow is also really difficult to automate just based on how everything worked. And uh, I'm going to show you an example of what we had to deal with in the next slide. And then finally, as time progressed and uh, more and more collections, ledgers, indices like Index or Barriorum and GR Cycle, the Global Registry of Scientific Collections, saw more activity uh, it was a lot of pressure on data providers to maintain their collections metadata in so many places at once. You know, so on this slide here, I say too many cooks in the kitchen, but really it's more like too many kitchens. You know, so in our view, consolidation was not only the smart way forward, but it was a necessary way forward. So here's an example of a submitted change request as seen on sort of our IDIC bio side of things. So you can see it is a partially uh, filled in JSON stub, uh, but crucial information like record set ID, it might be a little hard to see, but there are two little uh, elements here, record sets and record set query. Uh, those had to be manually filled in, and those were critical for internal uses. It's how we link um, specimen record sets that are on the IDIC bio portal with the entries in this list. And so we would have to manually track these down, add them, and then push it to Travis to have it validated and finalized and finally incorporated into the uh, big JSON endpoint. So again, this was really, really time consuming. And here's an example of Travis breaking. <laughs> so I tried looking up what this error was. Um, it is an unspecified error. It just said error. So that, again, these, these incidents happened more and more often, and it really kind of helped us push us over the edge to putting our heads together with GBIF and working on a better solution. So how did we do it? How did we make this change? So after many meetings and putting our heads together, the cyber infrastructure, cyber infrastructure teams of IDIC Bio and GBIF, they joined forces to ensure compatibility between our platforms. So we exported our JSON endpoint. Um, again, that's where all of the collections metadata that we had collected over the years um, we exported that and sent it to the GBIF cyber infrastructure team, and they imported it into GRCycle, the Global Registry of Scientific Collections. Um, then after that was, you know, unfortunately also required a lot of human intervention, so it was mostly myself and Marie Grosjean. Huge kudos to Marie, because she's awesome and helped out so much. Uh, but her and I spent a lot of time 
going through the data manually, cleaning it up, making sure that there were no duplicates, because you know you don't want 16 entries of the same collection or institution. And we got everything in line, so it was you know fully compatible with the structure that GRCycle was expecting. So then our cyber infrastructure team at iDigBio, we modified our collections list page um, so that instead of pulling from that original JSON endpoint, it would instead be compatible and would interface with the GBIF registry API. So it would pull all of these collections metadata directly from uh, GRCycle in the GBIF registry. So we've moved off of GitHub entirely. So where we stand now, uh, at least on the iDigBio and technical side of things and the user experience side of things, uh, now any sort of suggested changes, instead of having to go through GitHub, uh, they can just go directly through uh, the GR call or the GBIF registry. Um, and instead of relying on only iDigBio staff to review and approve any sort of suggested changes or revisions, um, now it's done by editors, mediators, and other such liaisons um, on GRCycle. And finally, you might be thinking, well, GRCycle, the G stands for global. iDigBio is US, US-based, US-centric. How does the list know which, which entries to populate with, or is the iDigBio collections list now just a complete carbon copy of what is on GRCycle? Well, we're making use of something called machine tags. Um, and with the use of these tags, it sort of signifies to our collections list page, you know, which entries from Jira Cycle to populate the page with and which ones to ignore. So here's a, an example screenshot from the GBIF registry. You can see at the top right corner, the suggest button. So users can use this button, no login required to suggest any sort of changes to collections metadata. Again, no login required, just leave an email address and preferably you know, some comments as to why you're suggesting these changes. So uh, here's that same collection on the US uh, collections list on the iDigBio website. And here are the machine tags that I mentioned earlier. Um, so again, we use these to sort of indicate that yes, this is something relevant for the iDigBio US collections list. And it also helps us link to uh, record sets with corresponding specimen record data from that collection. So you see here, um, you know, there's a record set identifier, a record set query. If you go back to the previous slide, you'll see that that data is fleshed out here. You can click on that. It'll take you to any associated record set data. So you can actually see the um, specimen record data. So what does this all mean? You know, it's, it's a list of collections. That's great. But what, is this, what does this mean for the community as a whole? Um, well, for one, you know, we're a lot closer to a sort of one-stop shop for a global index of natural history collections, and a comprehensive list of collections is not possible without the support of the overall community. So anything to make such an index more useful and streamlined to the community is something we strive to achieve. So we think that this move is one in the right direction. So with using GRCycle as sort of a main hub, interconnected with the likes of iTechBio, Index Herbariorum, and perhaps even more in the future, this leaves a lot less work for data providers, um, and it also facilitates an environment of international, interdimensional collaboration and cross-pollination, uh, which I believe is the most sustainable way forward in the global field of biodiversity informatics, because biodiversity itself is global. So our efforts and our community, it should be global too. Um, and as a bonus, yes, I am adding this audio after I finish my slides, but the collaboration between iDigBio and GBIF it's not stopping here. So we're hoping to further integrate our services, um, including but not limited to potentially synchronizing a registry of specimen record data sets to further enhance data sharing between iDigBio and GBIF and with the goal of creating a more unified family of biodiversity informatics data portals. So stay tuned. So thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, it's probably about uh, three in the morning my time by the time you're hearing this. So I'm probably not going to be in the audience to answer questions live, but um, this is my email address. I would love to hear from you if you have any questions, so please don't hesitate. Um, thank you very much. Perfect, so um, no, so uh, Kat isn't here to answer questions, but as she has said, please um, provide your questions in, per email or in the chat on 
uh, on Slack. Um, we are moving on to uh, our next talk by Wouter Atink um, from Naturalis. Yes? Okay. Um, I hope that you are all ready for the last presentation in this, uh, this session. My name is uh, Wouter Adink. I'm from uh, Naturalis Biodiversity Center in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm uh, coordinating the technical development of the DISCO research infrastructure. And uh, DISCO is one of the infrastructures that is involved in the, uh, in the bicycle project. And this morning I will give you a short introduction of the, uh, the goals of uh, linking data between infrastructures that we have in the bicycle project. Uh, for the few people that are uh, involved themselves uh, in the bicycle project, you will probably be uh, familiar with some of the slides already. Um, but for most of you, it will probably be new. Um, you may have also seen the, the poster that's outside for the people that are physically here. Um, I will also uh, tell you a little bit about the work that um, has been done um, for, for the development of, of best practices uh, between the infrastructures to, to enable this, uh, this linking. And uh, I will uh, also uh, tell you a little bit about the potential of uh, the cycle um, in, 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 in this uh, connection of, of data between infrastructures. So why linking data? Um, we live in a world that um, is, is changing and, and, and gets more and more digitized, where um, more and more data becomes available online. And today, um, if you are a taxonomist, um, you probably don't want to say anymore, hey, this, uh, this uh, organism is, is, is species X. You would like uh, to, to say, well, this is species X according to this, this treatment according to this, uh, these specimens and, and, and sequence information, and you want to have uh, direct links to the, to the data to, uh, to, to prove that. Uh, there are also other reasons for, for linking data. For instance, you would like to, uh, to be able to, um, uh, to, to find connections between uh, species, uh, uh, the relationships between species, between species and the environment, etc. So, um, I've been talk, uh, talked a few minutes now about data linking, but what is data linking? Um, in, the, in the bicycle projects, we, um, we use the term data linking for, for many different things, actually. Uh, we use it for link, uh, linking between individual data records in the different infrastructures, uh, which can be done through direct uh, matches of text strings, to persistent identifiers, um, these links uh, can be unidirectional, but uh, can also be bidirectional between two research infrastructures. Um, linking between uh, through literature, citations, and um, we are also talking about uh, linking through web APIs, with uh, identifiers to uh, to be interoperable and and um, uh, linking that is machine actionable. And we are also uh, talking about linking on a higher level, uh, cooperating and working together between the uh, infrastructures that are part of the project. Um, what kind of biodiversity data is involved in this? Uh, we have the, uh, the primary uh, data uh, supplied by, by uh, research infrastructures like DBIF and, and DISCO and Arctic Bio. Um, and, and we have uh, names, information, catalog of life, we have molecular data, literature, and um, we also uh, want to work towards linking with, with uh, general aggregators that are not all part of the projects, uh, but that should, uh, should benefit from the, the bi uh, bicycle work as well. Um, there are 15 uh, research infrastructures involved in the project. It's a European funded project. A three years project is now uh, halfway. Um, many of these infrastructures are European, but there are also several that are actually global. Uh, so although it's a European funded project, it's, uh, it has a global scope as well. We have some challenges in the project um, that we want to, uh, to address. Um, so how do we link uh, the, these objects uh, in the infrastructures together? And how do we provide search and access to that data? 
Um, how, how do we want to store these, these links and, and how, to, how do we want to manage these and to annotate these? Um, and especially for literature data, um, we will need some automated tools and workflows for data liberation uh, from the, uh, the PDFs, from the, from the text. Uh, linking between uh, infrastructures is still uh, in its infancy. Um, there is currently uh, not yet sufficient use of, uh, of persistent identifiers within the different infrastructures. Uh, different infrastructures use uh, different mechanisms for this. Um, there are redundant and incompatible processes for cleaning and interpreting uh, data and um, mechanisms for experts to curate and improve the data are usually absent. We have seen a few talks uh, during the TEFIC uh, conference up to now that uh, talk about um, annotations on, on data. So this, this uh, is work that's evolving, but it uh, still needs to develop a lot. Um, how do we want to address these, uh, these things, these challenges? Uh, well, mainly through joint research activities. Um, that uh, should work towards development of open APIs at each uh, infrastructure following uh, accepted standards like the TEFIC standards. Um, new tools and services uh, towards data linking, um, testing of these, uh, these, uh, these new uh, tools and APIs through uh, transnational and virtual access. And we want to establish a, um, uh, a one-stop shop, uh, if what we call a fair data place, where you uh, should uh, be able to go to for search and access to the, uh, to the data linkages. How will that, uh, that fair data place uh, work? Uh, we don't know yet exactly. It's uh, something that we are still discussing. Um, but we want uh, to use the APIs at the different infrastructures uh, to, uh, and, and, and provide a cent central search facility on top of that. Uh, and that should probably uh, be integrated with something that we call uh, the Biodiversity Knowledge Hub, which will contain uh, the, the, the collective knowledge of the infrastructures uh, and also the best practices. And that Biodiversity Knowledge Hub is going to be uh, hosted by GBIF, uh, but it will uh, get its own uh, domain name. Um, so this, uh, this fair data place should, should link uh, specimen uh, data, taxonomic names uh, and hierarchies, molecular data and occurrence uh, record and also literature together. Um, some um, best practices we are working on in support of, uh, of this data linking. Um, this work has been based on early recommendations uh, following a hackathon that was organized through the project uh, for interoperability between the infrastructures. It has been based on work done by the TEDWIC interest group for biodiversity services and clients. And also we have had several uh, discussions together with uh, our eyes uh, through a technical forum within the project towards these, uh, these recommendations. Um, we have created um, best practices uh, in, in uh, six different areas, modalities of access, building communities and trust, technologies and standards, versioning of APIs, the linking and the API design and naming conventions. 29 uh, best practices and each of these best practices uh, has uh, several recommendations. In total, there are 65 recommendations, and these best practices and recommendations will be uh, provided online through the uh, Biodiversity Knowledge Hub. Um, so, uh, what is the, the potential of, uh, of GeoCycle in this? I think uh, GeoCycle has great potential to, uh, to become one node in, uh, in, in, in the graph of, of connected data. Uh, as you has, have heard already, um, GeoCycle provides the, 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 the uh, descriptions for the collections. Uh, I think for linking with data, we are uh, especially interested in uh, collection facilities. Um, in principle, you, you can group ev every uh, uh, group of, of specimens together uh, in a collection. Um, you can have uh, uh, thematic collections like uh, a collection of specimens based on the collector or the place where it was collected. But I think for, collection with, uh, for, for connection with other data, we are mainly interested in 
collections that um, are organized in a way that there are have, uh, have different policies uh, for access, different policies for loans, visits, and curation from uh, the, the rest of the specimens within an institution. Um, to connect that to, uh, to, to data sets, to, uh, to, to the specimens, and to organizations, uh, it would uh, need to, to have uh, persistent and resolvable identifiers that uh, provide some machine-readable uh, metadata. Uh, and it should be able to provide uh, uh, historical uh, identifiers. It does that already. Um, so uh, a lot of a lot of the required functionality for for um, integrating the the, the geocycle within the, the bigger network of infrastructures is already in place. Actually, uh, it should also include uh, for the, the the connection to organizations. Uh, identifiers that are currently in use in the other infrastructures, uh, for instance, the ROR's, the Research Organization Identifiers. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, Walter. Um, other questions here in the room? Other questions online? There's a question. Uh, Marie. So, hi. Hi. Thank you, Walter, uh, uh, for, uh, for your presentation. I was wondering um, if there was um, anything that could be done maybe at the GR cycle level to help with the bicycle work. I mean, I know we're involved, but maybe that would be nice if, if you had any, any thoughts you wanted to share with the broader <laughs> community. Yeah, so uh, one thing that would be needed is, uh, is that uh, in GR cycle, so if we see GeoCycle as the, as the global register for, for collections, it would be also nice to have that as the global uh, point of, uh, uh, of access for the, the identifiers for the collection descriptions. So um, that's something, some work could be done there. Um, as I said, we may need to have uh, a separation between the collection facilities and other collections in GeoCycle, uh, which is not currently present. Um, and um, it would be good if there is some, some machine actionable uh, or machine readable metadata uh, provided for the, for the records, uh, which is not in place yet, I think. Uh, and also it should, uh, in particular for the, for the organizations, it should, uh, should uh, include the, uh, the, uh, the persistent identifiers for the organizations. So that uh, the, the organizations that are mentioned in the other infrastructures can, can uh, be linked to that. Okay. Okay. We have one question. There are a couple of questions up here in the uh, online forum, if you have a minute. One um, for Kat, one for Walter. Walter, there's a question from Esteban who's asking where can we get access to the best practices and recommendations? Is, there a URL, maybe you can. Yeah, um, the deliverable is due for the end of this month, so they are um, in the in, in the process of being finalized uh, currently, and they will be provided through the biodiversity knowledge hub. Uh, that is, uh, that will be a new um, web portal provided by the bicycle project, uh, and that's not available yet, uh, but it's currently under uh, development. Thanks, Walter. Um, and then another one from, um, from Esteban as well. This one I think is for Kat. Um, he'd like to know um, how you're encouraging personnel of the collections to curate their entries in GR cycle. Okay, it's probably not online, right? Yeah. Kat, if you are there, please. Unlock. Nope. If not, we can send that one across to to Cat for you. And I was Esteban. wondering if uh, Maria Regina could say something to this question for the Brazilian network. And with that, we could move into the discussion section of the symposium. Maria, would 
would, would you be able to, to answer the question about um, how, how to encourage personal um, of the collections to create the entries um, in GeoCycle or in, in your network? Yeah, I, I cannot say anything about GeoCycle, but we we are always uh, promoting meetings and and symposiums to highlight the importance of creating the data and the quality of the data that we are displaying online. So. Uh, the creators can see that uh, when the collection is better created, they are much more consulted and uh, the data are much more useful. So it's uh, a long-term uh, practice. So there is no simple way to show that to, to people. It's a... It's, uh, many years of work to 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 start doing that thanks a lot that um is a great perspective on building a global network and also building network networks in general um i would like to ask the, um to do a round um, uh, ask the presenters um, what do you expect um, from a, a more global network? So what do you expect by connecting network uh, collections? Um, what would, how, how would you use this network? What would you need to build such a network? Um, yeah, what would you expect from such a network? Um, and I would like to, to start um, in the order we had the presentation. I would like to, to start with um, Maria. Well, uh, as I said in my presentation, we are stronger together. So if we can share our solutions and also the problems, I think we can be much more organized and, and much more useful to, to everyone. So that's our experience. I think it's, it's the way, really. Thanks a lot. Um, Sharon? Would you, um, could you answer the question? Um, I guess from a, you know, my perspective sitting as a single institution over here, um, the, the point that um, Bauta made about identifiers and just reducing the amount of, of effort and work that people on the ground in museums, the collection staff, the curatorial staff have to, um, reducing the amount of time they have to spend answering questions and sharing data. By connecting up these infrastructures, we don't have to answer everybody's questions separately. We can provide information um, once. Um, certainly for us, a lot, of, a lot of this is about standards and sharing of the standards across those infrastructures, both the data standards and the technical infrastructure pieces. Identifiers, as Valta said, is really, really, really critical for us. Um, you know, if six, six infrastructures have six copies of our uh, institutional records, that makes life really, really difficult. So yeah, echoing um, Marie and Maria, we're, we're stronger and better off doing this together. Um. Yeah, that's, hi, that's Marie uh, replying. And, and Sharon, I completely agree with you. And I would just add one more thing is that any, I mean, it's really difficult to um, get people to um, to share their data on GBIF. It's very difficult to get them to update their records because it, it's just it's just a lot of work. And well, we all know that institutions don't always have the resources and time. So if there is like one 
um, data mobilized because uh, one data set mobilized, one collection that become available online just um, because someone uh, was able to identify that via any of those repository and cross-link and, 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 and be able to access it and be able to contact the people, that's, that's, that's really great. Like, um, it's always one little step at a time, so anything that can help, really, really useful, um, I think. Uh, and, and then with the work that the African and Asian contractors do, it's very plain that often the information is just not available or accessible easily. It's in another language, it's, the websites are down, and so sometimes the, the traces we have are only via external platforms, not necessarily just GeoCycle, but, um, and so uh, if we can maintain that, if we can cross-link, if we can have uh, this, it's, it's really a great way to, um, to, to help those one little step at a time and making information available more globally. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Wouter. Yeah, um, two things. Institutions have their own preferences for, for uh, the tooling to, uh, to create these uh, collection descriptions. Some are using IDIC Bio uh, or uh, the, the GeoCycle, some are using uh, Index Barium, some are using the CETAF register. And I think we should continue to support that. Um, and the, the, uh, having an identifier, unique identifier, and having knowledge of which system is used as the, uh, this, the so-called source system of master uh, for, the, for the data is important. Uh, but at the same time, we should, uh, we should try to make all the data uh, accessible at, uh, at one point to the uh, geocycle as, uh, as, as one point of entry uh, globally. Uh, and that for me is the, the, the global network actually. Um, the other thing I want to mention is what we cannot yet do currently is um, combining the, uh, the information of the individual um, collections uh, to have an overview of, of these collections, of their, their strengths, um, uh, how uh, the situation is with uh, the state of digitization, etc. And this is especially important for, for DISCO, who wants to treat all the collections in, in Europe as one virtual uh, collection. Um, so we really need to move towards um, the, the incorporation of the, of the Letterma Core, the new standard that uh, is being worked on in, in Tetwick, um, so that we have more standardized descriptions um, with information that is actually uh, relevant for, uh, for creating like virtual dashboards that we can, uh, can uh, use the collective information of the individual uh, collection descriptions together to provide an insight of, uh, of the status and, and the strengths of these collections. Thanks a lot. Um, so, before I give there's the... A, uh, mm -hmm. Nita, there's a, I wanted to bring up the, the questions from Carlos. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of questions um, from Carlos and he can probably say a, a lot more eloquently than I I am about to. Um, uh, they are posted in the Slack channel and also in the chat. Um, and basically, he, one of the another uh, layer to this is um, general impact factors and how how we can um, enable collection staff and staff to participate in in these infrastructures. Um, I'm going to post Carlos's question, and I don't know if. Um, if you're still around and if you want to speak a little bit to this um, yourself, Carlos. Yes, uh, thank you, I'm still around. <laughs> so basically I'm asking because I'm a Caribbean native and I am also um, open access activist, so to say. And one thing that um, I cannot say it in another way hurts me a lot is that I see that people keep using journal impact factors, which are based on a logical fallacy, to make their journal selections while publishing. 
And the direct output of that is that the main, the biggest amount of articles are being published paywall. And we had recently a very good um, example of that when so taxa which publishes 25 percent of new zoological descriptions lost its impact factor and then there was a movement of i support so taxa which was basically i support paywall publishing and why is that that is because there are perverse incentives awarding or rewarding scientists who publish on journals with a certain journal impact factor so one of the overarching situations that we have for the visibility of research data, scientific data, biodiversity data, is that we have to recognize the journal impact factors as the main threat to open access data. Yeah, and we have to move away from journal impact factors. Recently this year, the German funders move away from journal impact factors for assessing research, but we all have to do that, yeah? So I, I hope that within the network, we manage to move away from journal impact factors, that we endorse openness about all other journal selection things, and that we start compiling. I compile myself a directory of platinum open access journals for myriapodology so that I can show that there are places where one can publish open access and for free. So that there is no more open access descriptions and no more open access new taxa, not because there are no venues where to publish for free, but because of wrong journal selection practices. So I hope that through that network and for Latin America and the Caribbean, we can endorse better publishing practices and we can reach out to the collection staff and to the researchers themselves and we can also identify the perverse incentives which are policies that reward researchers on the gif of the journal they publish in so that we can start changing and tackling the situation and that's yeah it. yeah no that's 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 one of those issues that i think um is 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 pervasive through through a lot of what we're doing in the um in the community and i I guess I would like to um, point to GBIF and GR cycle and the openness of the data there. And hopefully these are some, some things that can be taken on board in, in those infrastructures, because certainly that acknowledgement through open source and um, publications is, is going to be critical. So um, I'm going to hand it back to you in the, in the, um, in Bulgaria, Yuta, because I think okay. we're getting to time. Okay. Yes. Um, Thanks, Carlos. Um, do we have time for one more contribution? Deb, do you want it? Do okay, good. <laughs> then um, we, I would like to close the session here. Thank you very much for your interest and for your contributions. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in the topic, um, please uh, continue to check the Slack channel and get in contact with us and your local collections. Have a good coffee break and day.